So CLL is uh, classically described as a relatively slow-growing uh, cancer of mature B cells or B lymphocytes, uh, uh, an important component of the adaptive uh, arm of our immune systems. Um, it's characterized by marked clinical heterogeneity. So what do I mean by that? Um, it can uh, behave and present in a variety of ways, and I think that one of the things you will uh, learn by sharing uh, your own experiences uh, uh, really captures that point in particular. Certainly there are some patients who may have uh, very indolent disease um, with little, if any, progression over long periods of time, and others who unfortunately may have a more aggressive course, require treatment earlier, um, and, uh, and there are certainly challenges in understanding that, uh, challenges in coping and dealing with that. Um, but fortunately, I think uh, particularly in the last uh, decade, there's been tremendous gain in understanding about the genetic and molecular underpinnings of CLL to try and help understand that heterogeneity uh, and be able to apply that uh, clinically, both through clinical management but also through clinical investigation and clinical trials. As a general, uh, and we'll come back to this, as a general comment, treatment really is indicated for patients who have symptomatic progressive disease, and we'll review those um, particular um, fairly standard criteria for treatment in a moment. Um, the last decade has been marked by tremendous improvements uh, through drug development, um, through uh, well-designed clinical trials that have shown important improvements in clinical outcomes, including uh, survival and disease control. And um, this uh, is reflected in large part by the understandings of the molecular uh, biology or the disease biology, the ability to target important aberrant pathways. Um, and to uh, shift from uh, an era where uh, we were largely dealing with empirical uh, um, choices of cytotoxic chemotherapy into an era that is becoming much more uh, targeted with rationally developed treatments that have um, seemingly uh, very good efficacy and, and also, for the most part, improvements in tolerability. Uh, having said that, the flip side of that is with this sort of relative explosion in drug development, novel agents, um, and the ability to combine with older therapies, it has made for quite a complicated landscape, I would say, both from an investigative standpoint um, through the clinical trial enterprise, but also in the clinic when it comes to decision making. I think that that remains still a challenge, trying to um, provide optimal treatment for individuals depending upon not only their disease biology, but their own specific patient factors and comorbidities. Um, it is, a, it is the most common form of leukemia in the Western, uh, the Western Hemisphere. Um, uh, it, it has a, a, an incidence which, which increases with age. Uh, the median age at diagnosis is about 72. Uh, relatively speaking, uh, a small proportion of patients are diagnosed before the age of 50. Having said that, it's not uncommon, and we do see it very frequently in the clinic, and I think uh, certainly with changes in the way uh, healthcare is delivered, it's very difficult to see a doctor and not get a blood count or some blood test done. We're certainly seeing an increase in the number of patients being referred for asymptomatic incidental um, mild abnormalities in their white blood cell count. Uh, often um, that uh, is occurring at a younger age when maybe in the past they may not have come to light until uh, later in their disease course. The environmental um, predisposition, predisposition remains largely unknown. There are certainly uh, some recognized uh, associations, and I think many in the room are aware of the, um, uh, the uh, relationship with uh, uh, Agent Orange with Vietnam veterans. Um, but it's still an active area of investigation. What is, it, what is it that actually triggers and ultimately leads to the formation of this malignant clone and, and ultimately its progression? And from a genetic perspective, again, clearly there are some genetic um, uh, uh, predispositions. Um, 
among, uh, among the lymphoid malignancies, lymphomas, et cetera, CLL actually has quite a high incidence of uh, family members, or first-degree family members that are, that are affected with this disease. Um, it's an ac another active area of investigation. Uh, this is not yet at the point where we're really um, able to genetically screen or uh, provide uh, other preventative measures, but nonetheless, there's obviously a genetic environmental uh, links that need to, be need to be better understood. Uh, just for those who like, like graphs or see things better graphically, this is just some older data, but which is still relatively reflective of the incidence uh, of, the, of the disease in Canada, showing the, um, uh, uh, the uh, incidence compared to, related, uh, compared to other types of leukemias, AML, CML, and acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Again, this uh, clear uh, increased incidence as, uh, as, as the population ages with a relatively small proportion in the 20 to 50 range. Um, I think the youngest person that I have in my practice is, was diagnosed in there uh, at around about age 22, and I'm sure others have examples of that, so it is still, um, uh, it is still an issue. Um, and there's a slight, uh, about, a, about a two to one male to female predominance. In terms of diagnosis, the diagnosis of CLL can be made by submitting a blood sample for a test called flow cytometry, which is a test that is able to characterize the makeup of uh, the lymphocytes in the peripheral blood and determine if they are cancerous clone, uh, or a malignant clone. They, uh, on the uh, right-hand side of, this, of the slide, you see a, a typical example of what, lymph, what leukemic lymphocytes look like in, uh, under the microscope a smudge cell in the top right-hand corner, which is really an artifact of the preparation of the slide, not necessarily specific to CLL. Um, and uh, the diagnosis of CLL requires that there be a proportion um, uh, uh, of greater than five times 10 to the ninth per liter malignant uh, or monoclonal B cells in the peripheral blood. Um, these are typically small, mature, uh, normal-looking lymphocytes. They have a very characteristic immunophenotype that for most patients, they're able to um, uh, fairly easily determine uh, the, the, the nature of their, of their disease. Uh, you can see the classic immunophenotype uh, shown on the screen. These cells are CD5 positive and 23 positive. Uh, they typically weakly express CD20. Um, and although there are atypical variants, uh, most would fit into this category. Uh, I realize that some of you don't, and that sometimes is an area of frustration where there can be some overlap with related types of indolent B cell lymphoma. Um, and small lymphocytic lymphoma, which I, I, which, which I uh, realize uh, some of you have been uh, diagnosed with, is really the nodal counterpart of CLL. So rather than seeing the disease in the peripheral blood, it's really, ref it's really isolated to the, to the, uh, to the, the lymph nodes and, and spleen. You don't see that, uh, that high white count that you do with CLL. But these are really um, diseases uh, along a spectrum. They're, 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 um, they're treated essentially identically uh, and are considered uh, the same disease with a, with, 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 with a different presentation. Uh, in the absence of any um, swollen lymph nodes or liver or spleen, uh, and with, uh, but, within, but still with, with abnormal clonal B cells in the peripheral blood that are less than five, we would term this sort of, if you like, a pre-leukemic condition of monoclonal B lymphocytosis. So that's kind of the spectrum of, of, uh, of the disorder. From a clinical presentation perspective, uh, as I just mentioned, it's not uncommon for patients to present entirely asymptomatic with, uh, with an abnormal blood count that's been picked up incidentally through a family physician or, or other, uh, other healthcare provider. Um, but certainly there are a number of uh, clinical manifestations that may develop uh, either over the course of the disease and may even be present at the initial diagnosis of the disease. Uh, and they're shown there um, consisting primarily of swollen lymph nodes. Um, sometimes they're asymptomatic, but other times they can be tender or uncomfortable, and as they grow can be, um, can be uh, somewhat uh, compressive and uncomfortable. Uh, an enlargement in the liver and spleen is, uh, again, quite common. Uh, again, maybe asymptomatic, but at times as it becomes uh, enlarged, may lead to symptoms, uh, abdominal symptoms, sometimes the sensation of feeling full quickly after, uh, after eating relatively small amounts, something we call early satiety. Uh, and B symptoms, which are um, uh, systemic symptoms um, are related to the underlying uh, uh, CLL, 
uh, fevers, uh, unexplained uh, drenching night sweats typically, and weight loss are all uh, often um, uh, manifestations of the underlying disease. There can be symptoms related to the abnormalities in the healthy blood cells, sometimes related to a variety of factors, which we'll come back to in a later slide. Anemia, sometimes, uh, uh, which is a, a low red blood cell or hemoglobin level. Um, low platelets, which is called thrombocytopenia, or even low healthy white blood cells, neutropenia, can be related to um, either marrow infiltration or other, uh, other uh, complications of the, of the disease.